Today we're talking about geometric designs and symmetries. These are symmetries and designs and patterns that are used by lots of different cultures uh, as an integral part of the arts and the crafts that they do within their cultures. And we're going to start our study of mathematical ideas um, by looking at this kind of geometric structure and repetition. So let's be a bit more precise about design pattern repetition. What does that mean? What are we looking for? Well, what we're after here is that if the artist or the craftsman has taken some motif and has used a, some kind of a repetition of it in a very geometrically regular pattern, then we would like to be able to have some sort of language to describe that regularity in a geometric form. And there are a couple of reasons why we're interested in doing this. One reason we can think of is that we would like to be able to model or capture the kind of design repetition that the artist is using within their art. What is it that they have been trying to do? A second view is that we should be able to describe the designs well enough to distinguish those designs that are common in one culture from those which are common in another when they're different. And so we should be able, in, at least in some situations, to be able to distinguish between different kinds of cultures based on what kinds of design patterns they use. And finally, we'd like to make sure that, or try, to understand what the artists are doing well enough that we would be able to create new art uh, that seems to fit within their constraints, their artistic values. In other words, the kind of art we should be, that we can produce are ones that that culture might recognize as their kind of art. So let's take a look at what kinds of design repetitions I want a little slightly more uh, carefully. Um, this is a, a statue from uh, Papua New Guinea. And it's got these uh, white circular dots around here um, all, that go all around this pattern here. And we can see that they're sort of spaced in some kind of a regular fashion, but there isn't really a geometric regularity. The, fundamentally, uh, the idea here is that probably is that they were putting these white dots on here um, and trying to fill up the space and not have too many of them too close and not have, you know, here's a reasonable gap, but you don't want to have big areas that don't have um, some of that design motif. So there's some kind of a geometric algorithm in terms of how they're doing it, but it's largely a random placement. Um, and we're not interested, at least here in this class, for modeling this kind of random repetition. What we want is something in which there is a clear intentional design on the part of the artist for a repetition. So if I look at this chili grinder of the Aztec, um, then the pattern has some motifs. I have a flower motif here, and it's repeated here and over here again. So, and there's a nice regular, so that it makes a perfect equilateral triangle forming those three uh, flowers. In a similar sense, I have these three different uh, stripe motifs. And so I have two different kinds of motifs, both of which are repeated in a nice geometric regular fashion. Uh, this is also geometrically regular here in the center, but I'm not worried about that right now. Okay. And um, if we look at something like, say, my sweater that I'm wearing today, uh, this has a, certain, a great deal of regularity. It's a machine-made um, knitting. And so I have lots of regularity in what the stitches are and hence the small motifs that are making up the design. I have a very regular uh, color uh, repetition between the various colors that are used in here. But that's very regular because it's machine-made. And most of the time, the stuff we're looking at are things that artists have made. And so um, sometimes when we run across these kinds of things, we have to be, we, we don't want to get too picky about what we mean by a regular repetition of the design. So if I look at uh, these designs here carefully, I might notice there are some variations. So that this here, we have four lines in this particular motif, but over here we have five. This one also has five. Okay. In the same sense, if you look really carefully at these flowers, this flower has six petals, but this flower only has five petals. But nevertheless, we don't sort of hold that against the artist. We understand that we make minor mistakes, especially if we're not trying to be perfect. We're just trying to make a nice piece of pottery, a nice bowl to use. And so what we're after is this idea of intentional, the, the 
intent of the artist was almost certainly to make these things regular repetitions uh, of each other, and that's what we're going to be trying to model. So we don't expect perfection. Um, what we're kind of after is then artistic intent. That, in some sense, uh, that's a dangerous thing to, to, to aim for. Um, one can never really know what was in the mind of another artist, but nevertheless, it's something that we use as a guide to what we're interested in looking at and how we classify the things we're looking at. Now, symmetries are certainly one of the most important and common kinds of geometric repetition. Uh, a symmetry is the movement of a design that preserves distance between two points and leaves a design looking essentially unchanged after we've done the movement from what it was before. Now what I mean by preserves distance is that if I've taken the pattern and I've moved it from one place over to another, then if two points were three inches apart before I do the move, and then I move it someplace else, then there should still be about three inches uh, apart, um, both before and after. Okay? And when I say it leaves the design unchanged, well, more or less unchanged, we ignore, as we said, um, artistic imperfections in the designs. And we usually sort of ignore edge effects, so that if I have uh, some design that stretches out to, to, for some amount of distance, we don't worry about the fact that there's an edge here and an edge here that aren't, of course, replicated inside the rest of the pattern. So we act as if, in most cases, as if the design sort of keeps going on um, infinitely far, if that's what's necessary to kind of interpret the design. Of the different kinds of geometric repetitions, these things that we call symmetries are the most important of these. Uh, and sort of the reason for that is, first off, they arise broadly a lot, across a lot of different cultures and across a lot of different time periods. So it's what's coming up in the art, in art, geometric art, patterned art, the most. Therefore, it's certainly something we need to spend some time looking at and understanding. Uh, they're also the easiest to classify into categories. There are a fixed number of symmetries because of the constraints of, of these two criteria here. There's only certain kinds of things that work as symmetries, so it makes it easier to classify things for comparison purposes. So I can compare what this culture does with some other cultures uh, if I have sort of precise categories to put these things into. Um, they're also the most mathematical. Be these constraints here turn out to make, as we'll see later, uh, symmetries are a very mathematical kind of geometric uh, repetition. Um, and finally, a lot of the other kinds of regular patterning, a lot of the other algorithms that we'll run into, can really be viewed as variations of symmetries in uh, different kinds of ways. So, let's look at a little bit more detail on what I was saying there about what I mean by a symmetry. Um, and so, if I look at this particular shield here, this is a Papua New Guinea um, war shield, and we, this has what we're going to be referring to as translational symmetry. So if I were to slide the picture up and take these two plants and slide them up, they would pretty much land on these two plants as well. Uh, if you look, you can see there's a little bit of artistic variation, but we don't worry about that. And then if I slid those two plants up again, they would land here. And of course, if I slid those plants up, they would land someplace where there wasn't any, any additional plants. Uh, so when we get to the edge here, there's uh, some variation. And if we look at what's happening here along the outside, I've got plants and plants here. This sort of looks like maybe half of a plant. Um, but this now is something different. There's something, other, uh, something else interesting is going on here. But we sort of ignore that kind of a thing when we're looking at the overall general pattern of the design. So we analyze this particular design as if the main part of it, not counting the bottom edge and the top edge, as if this main part sort of went on in an infinite strip up and down. This uh, basket uh, here from uh, Mexico uh, has a similar sort of a, this is a, a, what we'll be calling wallpaper patterns and wallpaper designs. And of course, here at the very top, the basket itself doesn't go on forever, but we sort of understand the artistic intent. We see a brown triangle here, so we understand that the artist, if they felt like making it any bigger, would have finished this part off to make another brown triangle, but they stopped at some point. 
But for analyzing this from the symmetry standpoint, a translation, this brown triangle goes up to this brown triangle. This brown triangle goes up to where we imagine another brown triangle would be, uh, assuming that these things went forever. Okay? And in most cases, this seems to capture uh, the artistic intent of what was meant, what the artist meant to do. Not always. There are some cases where arguments can be made that extending these, these designs infinitely was not at all what the artist meant. But we'll worry about some of those when we see them. Now, the other thing I said was that I'm looking for intentional symmetries. Uh, and in some situations, it becomes a little fuzzy as to whether or not something is happening um, uh, because the artist meant it, or maybe it's just happening, happening so, sort of accidentally. So in this prehistoric cave drawing from the Altamira uh, Caves in Spain, uh, there's a lot of symmetry. I have some dots here that are in a nice regular pa fashion. I have some lines here that are being repeated regularly. A lot of this hair is certainly being repeated very regularly um, along the various uh, portions of the animal. So was this an intended symmetry, especially this sort of repetition this way and this way? It's, was that intentional or was it just accidental because the artist was trying to imitate nature and nature has some symmetry built into it? Well, uh, historically it seems like a lot of abstract designs and geometric designs in various cultures and a lot of early use of, of symmetry were inspired by these natural designs. And so it seems that the artist, even if they didn't mean this originally at some stage, uh, that there is some stage at which they're learning the, uh, some of these ideas of repetition and symmetry, and that that becomes part of their designs. We can't always be sure exactly when that's happening. But even if this isn't sort of intentional, it's kind of on the road to being so, on the road to being intentional. So unless we have some strong reason to believe otherwise, we usually view designs of this sort as having something where the artist meant this design to be intentional. You know, the fact that there is this very, very regular spacing here of these hairs hanging down, that they're all separated by the same amount, seems sort of a deliberate act on the part of that artist. Okay, I've talked about symmetry in a general sense. But let's talk about the specific kinds of things that come up as symmetries. And there are fundamentally four types of symmetries that we need to uh, pay attention to. And the first is what's referred to as rotation. So in rotation, we have a, some kind of an unmoving center of the design, and the design sort of rotates around that center point. Um, and, uh, uh, and how many times you can rotate around the point uh, until you get back to its starting location, we use the, the, the word, the, the technical term, the order of that rotation is how many times does it take for one element to rotate around uh, to get back to where it started from. So as an example, uh, this is from a paper some, one of my students did some years ago on uh, the art, the geometric art of Chinese bronzes, the, the, the geometric patterns there. And so these here both have a rotation point. In this case, it's right about here. If I were to hold that point fixed and rotate the entire design by 180 degrees, flip it all the way around, um, then the design would land back on top of itself. The same sort of thing happens here with a point right about there. And since this would rotate around once to come over to this point, and then wants to get back to where it started from, we refer to that as a rotation of order two, and sometimes we'll also use the terminology a twofold rotation. Um, either of those terms will occur in readings and uh, in lectures. So here's some examples of Chinese bronzes with a rotation of order four, a rotation of order five, another one of order five, and a rotation of order uh, six. And just to give a physical example, here's a, uh, uh, um, a copy of that uh, design. And I have stuck a thumb pin here. This is one of the ones of order five. And I've stuck a, uh, a pin here at the center location of where all of the rotation is, is happening. And when we're doing problems and analyzing art 
this it will do the same thing uh, in in some formal tech ways that we'll talk about. But we're going to want to mark the center of that rotation. Where is the rotation? And if I were to take this and rotate it around, let me actually mark one of these as a sort of a starting point. So I'm going to mark this one here, just so we can sort of see, if we wish, um, that that one is going to rotate around and eventually come back to itself. So if I were to rotate this counterclockwise, there's rotating by one click, and it pretty much lands on itself and uh, looks unchanged. We rotate it around another click. And again, the design is fundamentally, you know, if I separated the paper, the bottom layer from the top layer here, they would look pretty much the same. We can see there's some slight variation. And here's a third rotation, getting over to this point, and a fourth rotation. And then finally, a fifth rotation, which takes us all the way back to where we started. And the alignment now is uh, perfect. Okay. So that's what we mean physically by a uh, rotation. Okay. Now, the next kind of symmetry, uh, the, sec the second type of symmetry, is a reflection symmetry. So this comes from a, uh, a totem pole project uh, that uh, Sofia hernandez Craig did as part of her term project a couple of years back. And uh, here, the reflection is you know, a mirror reflection where the left side of this pointer and the right side of this pointer uh, are mirror images of each other. Uh, that's the kind of symmetry that psychologists usually mean when they just sort of use the term symmetry all by itself. This, this concept of, of the right to left symmetry in people and animals is something that they study um, a, a lot. But, there, but there's a lot of different kinds of reflections and a lot of different kinds of symmetries other than just that. So there's an example of what I mean by a reflection. Um, so the reflections are some kind of a mirror image across one, uh, across a line. And this is referred to by mathematicians then as a vertical reflection. This is a reflection across a vertical line. I mention that because not all disciplines use the same terminology. But in mathematics, this is referred to as a vertical reflection. And if I look at uh, something like this, the, this African mask, this one has two different kinds of reflections. So I have a vertical reflection here, uh, a left to right reflection, a reflection across to this line. But there's another horizontal reflection that goes across this line. Uh, both of those are reflections, and we'll use that terminology of this being a vertical reflection, a reflection across a vertical line, and a horizontal reflection, a reflection across a horizontal line. Here I have the, uh, the same uh, mask on a, uh, a transparency, and across the center I have this horizontal line, and now I can fold this, so we don't necessarily just have to think of it as a mirror, we can also think about folding, and you should be able to see that the white images up on the top, the white eyebrows, um, match up pretty perfectly with the white here and the white here. There are some very small variations between these. So here I have a nose here, and I have a slightly different shape uh, of the bridge between the eyes. But other than that, this is pretty much a perfect symmetry uh, with both the vertical reflection and the horizontal reflection. This doesn't come across quite as well here at the bottom as I wish, but there is this four-leaf design up here at the top, and the same design is down here on the chin of the face, um, although it's a little dark to see in that particular picture. Um, I think you can see it a little bit better here. There's the blue four-leaf here and the blue four-leaf piece down here that match up quite well as well. So different kinds of reflections. Um, and uh, the horizontal reflections and the vertical reflections are certainly the most important, but there are other kinds of reflections that happen as well. So this is some ornamental brickwork from one of the buildings here on campus, Morse Ingersoll. And excluding this grill here in the middle, I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on the brickwork itself. There is a vertical reflection line, and there is a horizontal reflection line. But there's another reflection that's happening in here that's not quite so obvious, at least to most people. So although most of us can see the horizontal and vertical reflections, there is also something that's referred to as a diagonal reflection, 
a reflection across a diagonal line. So you should sort of look and see. Can you see that? Um, in most cultures, uh, people have a harder time seeing the diagonal reflections, but not true about all cultures. In some cultures, they seem to, to be able to detect them fairly easily. Uh, for most of us, it's easier if we draw a line here, and then we can see that this part is in fact the mirror image of this part across that diagonal reflection. And again, if I switch over to the, uh, to the projector, um, then we can take this design and simply fold it and on that diagonal line and I hope you can see that things pretty much match up. It's a little dark there but across that line we're seeing those uh, uh, this part here is the same as this part here. So. Uh, wherever we draw the reflection line, the idea is that one side of the line is the mirror image, the mirror match of the other side. And so that if we fold it across that line, we would get a uh, perfectly lined up design. The third type of symmetry that we're interested in is what's referred to as a translation. Um, and that's a movement in some sort of straight line, in some direction, where the design elements don't do anything. They don't turn, they don't flip, they don't change in any way. They're just being moved in a straight line. And um, uh, when we, uh, in our second lecture, we're going to focus on certain kinds of designs that happen when there are no translations at all. Okay. Uh, but other than that, we have three fundamental types. One is a strip pattern which is a translation in a straight line. Uh, in this case, it's going right to left. Uh, this also is the kind of design we saw in that Papua New Guinea shield from a bit earlier. And so, if I take a look at this kind of design, the idea is that if I have this design here, and I put another copy of it right on top of where it was, then I should be able to translate or slide, or just move, slide is a good word for it, um, a little bit of a distance. And now the design lines up. And so the design that's on top and the design on the back both look like the same design. I can move this along a little bit further. And again, things mostly line up. Now, of course, the piece that we're seeing uh, looks like this and has some endpoints. The actual piece that this comes from is a bit longer, but it's on a building, so it does stop at some stage. But we act as if, as we're sliding this along, as if these, this design just kept going right to left forever. Okay. Then the, uh, um, the other kind of design, the other sort of translation, is something that repeats, or the second type of translation, is something that repeats in two different directions. So here, this particular motif, this piece, I can move it in this direction here, right to left. I can also move it up and down. Okay. Now, I can also move it here on the diagonal, but we don't think of that as being sort of a third direction. Uh, but I mean anything in the two-dimensional plane, anything that would happen on a piece of paper. I can slide it to the right, I can slide it down, or I can slide it on the diagonal. And so again, actually seeing that translation, uh, if I start off with this design here, and take another copy of it, and get them so that they line up reasonably well. Okay. Now if I move this to the right, uh, you should see sort of not a whole lot of overlap, but at, at some point here, um, if I hold it just right, the design overlaps again. All the designs line up, more or less. There's always some slight artistic variation. And I could move it again over to about here. And again, most of the pieces, uh, many of the pieces from here, um, line up. Some of the other ones that are off slightly uh, come out a little bit dark. And in a similar sense, I could come back here and I could move it diagonally up and to the right. So I could move it up in this direction. And uh, again, the piece is pretty much the, the new pattern is the same as the old pattern. They overlap correctly. And I can continue moving it in that direction. And again, 
the, uh, the old location and the new location overlap. So they are not, uh, th that's the kind of repetition we're looking for. So here's uh, another form of translation that we can do, three-dimensional patterns. So if you look at this uh, synthetic chemical structure, uh, what we see is these little hexagonal cells here, and they're repeating in the right, off to the right, and they're repeating up to the top, and that would give me a two-dimensional thing. But if you look closely, you can see that underneath these, there are more layers of that sort of thing. And the same thing happens over with this other element that's just looking at it from a different, with a, a different type of camera, where we can sort of see that there's not only right to left and up and down, which would be the wallpaper design, but there's a forward and a back, so that we're getting some kind of a, a crystal structure um, out of this. Um, these kinds of designs are very important to chemists and geologists, but not nearly so often to the artists that we look at. So we won't be studying these uh, in, uh, in, in any uh, real way. Um, although there are certainly some three-dimensional objects that do have the kinds of symmetries that we're interested in especially when you get into architecture. So this is fundamentally a three-dimensional object, but it does not have this three-dimensional translations. All of the translations of these arches are just moving all in one straight direction. So although it's a three-dimensional thing, um, this is the, the, the group here, the symmetries going on here, count as one of these strict symmetries. Okay. Now, a final, uh, the final, and possibly hardest kind of symmetry to see is what's referred to as a glide reflection. And so when we talk about glide reflection, we're going to glide or slide or translate a motif in some particular direction, and then we're going to reflect it across a line. So a schematic of this might look this way. We take this triangle here, we slide it over to here, and then flip it across the line. And we did it again, we would slide it over to here, flip it across the line. Slide and flip, slide and flip. Okay. Um, this, by the way, is the symbol that we'll be using to indicate these kinds of things on our designs. And if you look at this particular uh, Chinese bronze, you might be able to, I hope you can see, this kind of design happening here. So here I have this motif here, and it sort of slides over to here, and then flips. So that this top part, or the mountain part, becomes the valley part here. And then when I take this, I can slide it over and it'll flip, and this valley part becomes the mountain part. Um, and so if I were to, again, look at that in a physical sense, we can imagine, this one doesn't uh, uh, line up very well, so I uh, because it's a uh, kind of wrapping around the pattern, uh, around the, the base. But we can sort of still see what's going on here if I just line these up. So I have the valley part here and the valley, part, uh, sorry, the mountain part here and the mountain part here. By the way, a lot of glide reflections have that aspect of sort of a mountain and a valley, or an up and then a down, um, goes back and forth. But now if I were to glide this over here, so now this mountain is kind of lined up with that valley, and then I do the reflection, there's the glide reflection. Now this valley and this valley are lining up. And this design that's inside the valley is really the same as the design that's here. And if I were to do this again, I would slide this over, glide this over one more step. This is now lined up with this. I would reflect it again. It's gone back to being a mountain, and this mountain and this mountain line up well. And what's inside the design is still what was inside that original design. Okay. So this is, in many cases, the hardest kind of a symmetry to see. It's also the hardest kind of symmetry for uh, certain artists to invent or to put into their craft work. So it turns out to be a fairly important one from the standpoint of distinguishing the art of some cultures from those of others. So it's the hardest, but it's possibly the most important. And this, as I said, this sort of up and down or mountain valley repetition is something that we see in a lot of these glide reflections, most of them. You, you can, if you look at it in the right way, you can see that sort of idea. And in this particular case, as in all of such cases, 
what is sort of inside this valley. So here's this valley. What's inside the valley is a flipped version of what's inside the mountain. There may be some value uh, in taking a look at at least one example of geometric algorithms that do not count as symmetry so that we sort of understand uh, the, what, these, what symmetries are. And so this is an example of a spirit mask from Papua New Guinea. Um, and we're going to see several different kinds of examples later of algorithms that aren't symmetries. But this particular one has a fairly common kind of a thing which is the idea of a concentric enlargement. So I have these circles here, and I have another circle around that. That's what I mean by concentric. And they just keep getting bigger and bigger. And around this face here, I have this two-lobe shape here. Um, and then I have another one that's just slightly larger that goes around that one, and they keep getting bigger and bigger. Um, there's also, a little, it's hard to see it in this picture, there are some ovals down here, sort of like chin dimples, that exactly match, slightly smaller, but pretty much match these ovals up here. Okay. So there's a lot of interesting symmetries going on in this particular one. But that concentric enlargement is not distance preserving. So that if I take these two points here and then look at the next larger one, well, of course, those two points, if I were to imagine moving this uh, um, you know, sort of two-lobed shape to the larger one, of course, the pieces would go apart. They would be slightly, you know, further away. And then the next one, they would get even further away. And if I looked at the two endpoints of the ovals, then as they go to larger and larger ovals, of course, they're getting further and further apart. So it's not distance preserving, and hence is not a symmetry. Very interesting. Certainly, we, if we were looking at this kind of art, we would certainly want to talk about that geometric repetition. But again, it's the kind of geometric algorithm that is specific to certain cultures. Papua New Guinea uses this a lot. Hawaiian quilting uses this idea quite a bit. Um, and, uh, uh, but even though it's being used in many places, it's not used nearly as broadly as the symmetry. So it's not quite as important to us as the symmetries themselves. But these kinds of things, the things that are sort of like symmetries but aren't really symmetries, are often the kind of thing that can help us tell one culture uh, apart from another culture from this kind of geometric mathematical uh, mode. Okay, that's our basic overview, basic introduction to this. I want to take a look at an example of how some of this works out um, in a particular culture. In this case, I'm going to be looking at Egyptian art. And so, um, I want to analyze uh, Egyptian art from the standpoint of which of these symmetries they use. And for comparison, uh, we sort of, you know, to be able to take a look at what's happening in Egyptian art, we want to have something to compare it with. So uh, I looked at some uh, ornamental art books from Europe and collected sort of what the Europeans um, on average do. So here's an example. I'm looking through a particular historic ornament book and uh, just under a quarter of, the, of those pieces of art have some kind of rotation in them. 16% have a horizontal reflection, 55% have a vertical reflection, and about 20% of them have glide reflections. You'll notice glide reflections are, well, they're not quite as uncommon as horizontal reflections, but they're not as common as some of these other kinds of symmetries here. Okay? Um, now, if you, if you add all those percentages up, of course, you'll get something much larger than 100% because um, there are uh, uh, a lot of these are strip symmetries which have different kinds, have multiple. They might have horizontal reflection and vertical reflection, as we saw. Okay. Now, if we look at Egyptian art, ancient Egyptian art here, I'm looking primarily before uh, contact with, with Rome. Um, what we see is uh, more rotations, a little bit more, not, not a whole lot. Um, almost twice as many horizontal reflections, so that's a little bit substantive. More vertical reflections, but an amazing drop in how many glide reflections there are. By the way, these numbers here are telling you how many pieces we looked at. Uh, so this was sort of a quick summary, only looked at 100 pieces of art. Uh, this was an extensive survey done by a student who was... Uh, uh, both an archaeology, uh, anthropology major, and was taking this course. So this is from his uh, term project. 
And this, uh, th this number in blood reflections now says there's something really, this is about one third of what we would have seen in historic uh, um, European art. So this is saying something different. And the fact that these numbers are somewhat larger possibly is just reflecting the fact that these patterns aren't coming up. And so they're doing other kinds of symmetry. Um, and uh, so we've got a lot more reflections, slightly more rotations, but an awful lot fewer glide reflections. Okay? Um, and what's kind of even more impressive is that most of those glide reflections probably were embedded inside other patterns that had other kinds of symmetries. So there was exactly one, out of 230 pieces, there was exactly one that had a glide reflection and nothing else in it. And even that one is kind of suspicious because that was a glide reflection on the leaves of a tree, but it was a tree being harvested in Lebanon. It was not even a tree from Egypt. Okay. So there's something very unusual going on here with a lack of glide reflections in Egyptian art. That means we would like to understand why. There's something going on here uh, that we should be able to understand or at least ask questions about from this surprising number. Now sometimes this kind of investigation only gives us questions. We can end up asking questions about cultures as to why they do some things and, and why not others. Some cases we can answer those, those questions. In other cases, we're just, we can make some, some guesses or some conjectures, or we're just basically asking something of the anthropologist or artist, art historians, as to why this might be going on. In this case, we think that there is very likely um, a, uh, an explanation that we can figure out in terms of what's going on. What does this mean? So there are two aspects uh, to sort of the conjecture as to why this lack of glide reflections comes in, this in, and two different parts of it. And the first part is that what we do know about Egyptian art is that the style that they're doing, the kinds of art, the kinds of designs that they're doing, is very conservative in the sense that it does not change over a very long period of time. For essentially 2,000 years, once certain kinds of designs and patterns become established as this is what Egyptian art does, this is what our ancestors did, it's not going to change over the, over the centuries or millennia even. Okay? So as you're constructing these kinds of things, new artists aren't going out and inventing new art styles. They're using the traditional forms. They'll, they maybe can do some small variations, but they can't, they really have to use traditional forms. Um, there are no new designs. So once the designs have been fixed, that's it. Those are our only choices, more or less. Okay. Now, as I was mentioning before, when I had that, uh, that bison up on the screen, we suspect that at least part of the impetus for designs and part of the, the, the development of geometric patterns uh, comes from the environment, comes from things around us, the, the, the things that we see in nature. And glide reflections come up in a couple of very particular places. One is, it comes up in animal tracking, in, in, in footprints. So if somebody is walking through the, the, the snow, if an animal is walking through mud, I can see where their tracks are, and I hope you can see the glide reflection here. So as this footprint goes up, it glides and reflects. Lands on that foot, glides and reflects. Okay. All the way up, glides. And uh, so, cultures that are doing a lot of animal tracking, that are doing hunting, that are looking for footprints, they notice these kinds of things. The, the, what happens with footprints becomes very, very important to them. Uh, but animal tracking is not something that's very important to the Egyptians. That's not where their protein is coming from. Their protein is coming from, uh, from fish and other sorts of, of seafood. Okay? So, this is, although certainly people would leave tracks um, in the dirt or the sand, uh, there was no particular need to pay attention to them or for somebody to, make, to take serious note of it. Okay? Um, another place that's very common to see uh, um, uh, glide reflections are with, in plant life. So 
there are two fundamental types of plants. Those that have um, opposite leaves, so that leaves along would, would be matching pairs. I'd have one pair here, and another pair here, and another pair here. But this is an example of the other kind of plant in which we have leaves growing off um, every, other, uh, um, every other side. So we're alternating. And I hope you see the glide reflection fundamental here in nature. This is pointing up. I glide along, it's pointing down. Glide along, it's pointing up. Okay? And so anybody who's paying attention to this kind of plant life um, will notice that kind of glide reflection. Of course, if you just have a sort of a lackadaisical uh, attitude towards plants, you may never have noticed this. But on the other hand, if you were a botanist or somebody who just really enjoyed spending time with plants and trying and, and growing different plants, this would be, would be something you would be very familiar with. So it sort of depends on your own interest, but you need to have plants of this form. Well, fundamentally, there really are no substantial plants in classical Egypt that have this kind of alternating design, okay? alternating uh, um, leaf structure. And uh, I looked through a collection of Egyptian plant books, and in those, we found uh, 29, um, most, in, in fact, it's surprising how often you can't really tell from Egyptian art what's going on with the plant they're looking at. Uh, Egyptian artists will spend a tremendous amount of time in getting fine level detail of what's happening with people and animals and stuff like that. But they don't really care much about plants. And so they just kind of draw like a tree. And you can tell it's a tree but you can't tell what kind of a tree it is because the artist hasn't been careful enough, hasn't been precise enough about what they're doing. Okay? And uh, so there are fairly few in which we could really tell whether in these plant books, that they, uh, books, pictures of plants from Egypt, um, what was going on. But the plant books that we looked at were focusing on uh, the plants that were known to exist the crops and ornamental plants that we know that they used. So even if they didn't pay attention to it, we can take a look at it. And of those, 29 of them were the opposite pair, with no glide reflections. Just, you know, if I've got pairs of leaves like this, I have a mirror, a right to left mirror, a right to left reflection. Uh, but this alternating is going to give us the glide reflection. And there was only one, okay? Um, and again, that was a plant that was being harvested in Syria. So, the, uh, the overall story here, the conjecture is, we do not have plants with substantial alternating leaves. There is, in some of the wheat that they were, that they were growing, they do have alternating uh, uh, leaves, um, and the plant, that plant was important, but the leaves were very small, and so you really have to look very carefully at it to see that they are alternating. The botanist noticed that, uh, but somebody who wasn't paying very close attention to the plant, who wasn't trying to put in a lot of detail into their art, would never notice it. Okay? And again, that was their attitude generally towards plants. So all in all, what we get out of this is early on, the early discoveries of symmetry very, most likely come from different kinds of natural and naturalistic phenomena. And the most important places, tracking and plants, where people would see glide reflections in the world around them, were not important to the Egyptians. Not that they weren't there, but that they weren't important to them. And so it seems very likely that the early Egyptian art forms just don't include them. That's not part of what they, of the kinds of designs that they do. And once those traditional art forms get set in place, later artists aren't allowed to sort of change that. They're not really allowed to come up with new forms, to have a new design that you, as a, as a, uh, 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 as a young artist, sort of see that you think is kind of cool. Too bad. You're not allowed to include that. Okay, let's sort of summarize what we've been talking about uh, today. So, Geometric patterns and designs are a form of geometrical, geometrical idea that arises in lots and lots of different kinds of cultures, in many places, everywhere around the world, almost, not everyone, 
but almost all cultures do some form of uh, geometrical design within their art, within their clothing, within their houses, someplace. Okay? The most important and the most widespread form of geometrical patterns, geometrical repetition, are these symmetries. So that's what we start with as our foundation. It's going to turn out that the idea of symmetries is also useful to us in a lot of other places. So that, for as a simple example, if I'm doing mathematical games uh, and doing something, let's say, as simple as tic-tac-toe, the fact that the tic-tac-toe board has symmetries to it is going to turn out to be important to us. The fact that all four corners of the tic-tac-toe board are symmetrical by a rotation and, and, sort of, and, diff and the various reflections mean that it doesn't really matter which of the four corners you start in if you were to start in a corner. All four corners are symmetrically the same. So this idea of symmetries is going to come up in a few other places within the ethnomathematics, uh, but it's in this geometrical repetition, these geometrical patterns, that it first makes itself uh, a very, very obvious. Okay? And the important thing then is not just that, this, that symmetries are there and lots and lots of people use symmetries and they appear in lots of cultures. That would probably be interesting in all by itself and would make interesting uh, artistic studies. But the fact is that different cultures take different approaches. They use certain sorts of symmetries. They use different variations of symmetries, color variations, those concentric kinds of circles, things of that sort. So we have ways sometimes of just distinguishing between adjacent cultures or shifts within a culture over time. Or in other cases, we're seeing certain things within their art and, we're, and we are led to the question of why are they doing that? Why are they doing something which is so different from what most cultures do? And usually that leads us to some interesting kind of question uh, about the culture. Okay? And so um, uh, we're interested in, the, in just the artistic aspect, we're interested in the mathematical aspect, but we're also trying to learn something using the math mathematical analysis as a way, in some cases, of learning something about the culture, or in some cases, uh, um, to lead us into asking interesting questions uh, about the culture that we're taking a look at. Okay? So that's it for an introduction to summary, uh, to, to in, sorry, an introduction to uh, symmetries, and we'll take a look at some of the specific examples of symmetries in our upcoming lectures.